As our population rises, we are consuming the Earth's natural resources at an unprecedented rate, placing critical ecosystems under immense stress and pushing countless species to the brink of extinction. Fortunately, an increasing number of communities, often led by indigenous peoples, are actively working to address centuries of environmental degradation. We wholeheartedly believe in maintaining and restoring balance to that ecosystem because it's important to everything that we depend on and everything that depends on it. Can we reverse the damage we've done before it's too late? In the rugged hills of California's Klamath River Basin, historic efforts are underway to restore an ecosystem in crisis. U.S. regulators approved a plan to demolish four dams. This is a major step forward in restoring the Klamath River, what's being called the largest river restoration project in American history. Res, an ecological restoration company, is working with local indigenous tribes to try to reverse decades of environmental degradation along the Klamath River. I'm excited to see that play out. I'm very, very optimistic that this is gonna be beneficial to the ecosystem and then as a byproduct of that to the, the people in the community. But why does this scenic region need to be restored? For thousands of years, the Klamath's vibrant waters have brought vitality to the surrounding region and its inhabitants. But in the 20th century, everything changed. Hydroelectric dams were constructed on the Klamath, choking the river's flow and disrupting its many vital functions. Here in the Klamath Basin, people are struggling, uh, the river is struggling, the fish are struggling, and we're all tied together. The dams dramatically transformed the landscape, creating massive artificial lakes known as reservoirs, where dangerous pathogens can flourish. Reservoirs are a perfect habitat for blue-green algae, and they thrive in the heat and the warm weather, and the offshoot of them is a toxin that then infects the rest of the river to the point where they could make you sick, they could kill your dogs. Obstructing the river also disrupted the flow of sediment, a loose material consisting of rocks and minerals, and the remains of plants and animals. In a healthy river system, Sediment erodes into the water, is transported downstream, and eventually gets deposited on the riverbed or back on land. This process is vital to maintaining the health of the ecosystem. Sediment needs to be doing things like building deltas, which protect our coastal communities, building our floodplains, which deposit really important nutrients onto lands that we then cultivate for agriculture. But dams store sediment the same way they store water. They prevent it from moving downstream. The dams also created physical barriers that block salmon from accessing over 400 miles of upstream spawning habitat crucial to their anadromous life cycle. Anadromous means they are born in the river and then they leave the river as juveniles and go out and spend two to five years in the ocean and then come back to the river generally very close to the same place that they were born and they spawn in that same area. The salmon's upriver journey is an incredible feat of endurance and determination. The fish can jump over five feet in the air to clear obstacles and can swim hundreds of miles upstream to reach their spawning grounds. Even the fish that make it to the spawning grounds and spawn, they're feeding the ecosystem. You know, their bodies are decomposing and the nutrients that they've attained from their years in the ocean is being deposited onto the landscape. And so there's this really important kind of energy flow. A big part of the redwood forest is those marine derived nutrients. Salmon are classified as a keystone species because they play a critical role in maintaining the overall health of their ecosystem and they are especially important to the Yurok and other indigenous tribes that have inhabited the Klamath River Basin for millennia. Without salmon, there wouldn't be Yurok people here. 
Salmon are one of those cultural keystone species that really define a large part of who Yurok people are. But years of environmental degradation caused by the dams have pushed salmon populations to the brink of collapse and imperiled the future of local tribes. Being on the river fishing with elders and family means a lot to us and is a big part of who we are as a people. When salmon populations are depressed like they have been, it's hard on the culture. No, I'm not the stolly. We'll stop the dam from falling. Thank you, sir. Determined to save the salmon and their ecosystem, the indigenous communities and other organizations led a tenacious grassroots campaign and eventually secured a landmark agreement to remove the dams and rejuvenate the Klamath Basin. This entire project, and not just removal of this dam, but the other three, is on a scale that hadn't been seen before. So we'll be here stewarding it, watching it, babying things along as needed. Before the dams can be demolished, crews must gradually drain vast amounts of water from the reservoirs and flush out millions of cubic feet of sediment trapped behind the dams. We know the best place for that sediment is in the ocean, right? Not stuck on the uplands. And so we're gonna promote sediment evacuation from the reservoir footprint, and then it will move down towards the ocean. After the reservoirs are drained, the restoration team will collect data on the evolving landscape and use it to shape their plan. Any good restoration project is gonna be adaptively managed. And that's particularly true for a dam removal project. You can't even see your landscape until they drop the reservoir. That is going to expose about 2,000 acres of land that have been underwater. We don't know exactly where we're gonna put each tree, and we don't know exactly how we're gonna grade the stream bed. And we'll figure it out after the reservoir is drawn down. Once the plan is updated, the restoration team will replant the reservoir footprints in order to reestablish healthy ecosystems. In preparation for this revegetation, workers have spent five years harvesting seeds from plants native to the area. The seeds were then sent to specialized nurseries to be multiplied many times over. The seed collection piece is the foundation of any revegetation program of this scale. You want your species to be from the place you're trying to restore. Plants adapt to their environment. And if they're there for generations, hundreds of years, thousands of years, then they're gonna perform better if they come from that genetic source. This effort has yielded approximately 17 billion seeds and tens of thousands of young plants ready to be installed in the newly exposed land. Revegetating the reservoir footprints will also help keep out invasive plant species that could destabilize the recovering ecosystems. It's our job to make sure that the invasive species don't take over and become the dominant vegetation type in these reservoirs. As the seeds and young plants develop, their roots will help stabilize the sediment-rich soil, preventing erosion. Next, Restoration crews will focus their efforts on creating fish habitat in a handful of key tributaries. Nature will make its own habitat, but we can speed it up. So if there's not enough habitat in some of these areas, we're gonna go in there and help create that. And so the approaches that we're taking on those tributaries are ones to add trees and boulders and additional structure that'll bring back bugs, that will then bring back fish and not just create opportunities for spawning habitat, but also opportunities for holding cover for juvenile fish to complete the first few months of their life cycle. The team will monitor various aspects of the restoration to make sure the project is on track. You can go out and do a monitoring plot and measure the percent vegetative cover, right? How much is bare dirt? How much is a grass? How much is a shrub? You can count the number of invasive species that have come up and then quantify what the vegetation community looks like compared against your success criteria and say, hey, we've met it or we've not. The team will also track the return of salmon to the restoration area. Fish presence monitoring is another component of the project. We send people out to physically look for fish. There's a bunch right here. Look at them all. 
We look for reds, which are the spawning beds of the salmon, where they've gone in and disturbed the bed of the river to deposit fertilized eggs. Once they deposit eggs and, and those eggs are fertilized, the salmon are done with their life cycle, they die. And so we know if there's a salmon carcass in a tributary, then that's an indication that fish can complete their life cycles. The return of salmon will be a promising indication that the project is on track. None of these things happen overnight. It took years to get the river to this degraded state. It's gonna take time for us to dig ourselves out of this hole. There's a lot of work to do, and we're fine with it taking a long time. Despite the long and difficult challenge ahead, the people working on this project are firmly committed to rejuvenating the Klamath River Basin for as long as it takes. Any restoration project, particularly dam removal or anything large, if it's successful, it's going to inspire others to do it. It's going to counter the narrative that it can't be done. I got into restoration because restoration is hope. It allows me to do something positive to kind of counteract all the negative that goes on in the world. Amidst the environmental disruption in the Klamath, there is a glimmer of hope. This historic endeavor symbolizes a growing commitment to healing our damaged ecosystems and restoring the delicate natural balance. I personally am ridiculously excited to be a part of it and can't wait to see it change over time. We're gonna be able to come out here and see salmon in a place where they haven't been in over 100 years. It's gonna be incredible. Thank you.